Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy little human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's morbid makeup video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all this craziness today, you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer. And today we're going to be discussing Rodney Alcala, the dating game killer. Are you familiar with this human piece of garbage? But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new morbid makeup video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. And you can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you want. They're both Bratterstein, but no pressure. So now that I'm done essentially begging you to join my cult, we can get into this video. Now, Rodney Alcala, if you are unfamiliar, is a serial killer whose murder spread from coast to coast, literally from California to New York. While his total number of victims is unknown, he has been officially linked to eight murders in California, Wyoming, and New York. But due to the sheer number of photos he had in his possession, which we're going to get into in this video, and his specific MO, his kill count, if you will, could be over 100. And that is just truly horrifying. Now I'm going to get into telling you all of these details. And while I tell you the story um, of this horrible human being, I'm going to be putting on a full face of makeup. Now, if that's not your thing, thanks for hanging out this long. I hope you find somebody who's more your speed all the good feelings for you to you and your loved ones. But if you're kind of on the fence, like, hmm, that seems weird. I don't know how I feel. Maybe stick around. You might be surprised by how much you like me. With all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of Rodney Alcala, the dating game killer. Rodney James Alcala was born in San Antonio, Texas on August 23rd, 1943, making him a Virgo. Rodney was born to parents Raul Alcala Bucor, his father, and Anna Marie Gutierrez, his mother. There isn't a ton of information known out there about the marriage between his parents or what kind of went wrong there, but at some point his dad was just like, deuces, completely bailed out, leaving his mother to raise him and his siblings alone. Uh, I know that they ended up in Mexico for a time after San Antonio, and eventually they ended up landing themselves in Los Angeles. It was just Rodney, his siblings, and his mother because his dad was gone. He had bailed. He was like... He knew. He's like, I know what's going to come and I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have any part of it. He, that didn't happen, but you know what I mean? As a teenager, Rodney was pretty unremarkable. He, you know, was goofy. He was friendly. He had a lot of friends. He had a lot of girlfriends. He was just a very normal uh, kid and teenager. He was described as just perfectly, absolutely normal. There was nothing in his past that you could look at and be like, ah, that's what created the monster that he inevitably became. Everything from what we know, from what people are willing to say, was just totally run of the mill, average, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Rodney ended up enlisting in the army in 1960, which he would have been a, he would have been 17. Is that right? Wow. You can't even, you can't even legally drink or rent a car, but yeah, sure. Join the military. That's weird. Anyway. So he joined the military and he was a clerk from what I read online. So he didn't actually see any battle. So I guess that's good since he was so young. Um, and it was while in the military that his sort of mental health first came into play and got onto people's radar. It was while in the army that Rodney had a sort of mental breakdown and he actually ended up running away from the military, which is like, a big no-no and he ran to his mother and his mother was like, listen, what's up? And he's like, I don't want to be in the military. This was a giant mistake. Like he was just freaking out. And she's like, listen, you got to go back. I don't know exactly what she said, but she convinced him to go back to the military. And when he went back, he ended up meeting with a psychiatrist and he ended up, you know, talking to the psychiatrist and it was determined that he had, uh, he was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder and was subsequently discharged from the army. After leaving the military, Rodney enrol enrolled, enrolled, that word is so hard for me. Rodney enrolled in the UCLA School for Fine Arts. And it was while here, he decided that he wanted to be a photographer. That was his 
le passion. Like this is what he wanted to do with his life and he did really well in school and he ended up graduating from this school with a bachelor's degree. Rodney Alcala's first known crime happened in 1968 when Rodney would have been just 25 years old. And keep in mind I said his first known crime because it's believed that there's a lot of things that have happened in his life and a lot of crimes that he's committed that we just don't know about yet. But we'll get into all that later. On this day in Los Angeles, Rodney Alcala lured an eight-year-old girl named Tally Shapiro into his car. And see, Tally knew that she wasn't supposed to ride with strangers, so she was feeling super apprehensive when the man pulled up next to her in his car while she was walking down the street. And he ended up convincing her to get in the car by saying he knew her parents and he had this really cool photo to show her because, she, you know, he was a photographer. And she reluctantly got into the car because she believed, because she was eight years old, that this guy did know her parents and that nothing bad was going to happen to her. Luckily for this girl, I suppose, I don't know if anything about this situation is really lucky, but a passing motorist saw the encounter between Alcala and Tally. He was driving and he noticed that the beige car didn't have any plates and he noticed that the man in the car had long curly hair. And he said that the whole thing just felt a little weird to him because he saw that the car was kind of driving slowly next to her like the person was trying to convince her and that the girl seemed weird about getting in the car at first but then did end up getting in. And this is the perfect example of see something, say something because it's, I believe that due to him, Tally ended up surviving. I think that's the only reason that this wasn't his first known murder and just his first known horrible, horrible assault. This man calls the police. He tells police what he saw. He's like, it just, the whole situation didn't sit quite right with me. So police show up and the man points out a first floor apartment because he followed him. He followed Rodney and the girl all the way to Rodney's apartment complex. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. So when the police arrive, he points out a first floor apartment and the police go and knock on the door. And it takes a while, but Rodney finally like responds. I believe he responded through the window. I don't believe he opened the door. And he was like, you know, what's up? And they told him, you know, we want to talk to you. And he's like, one second, I just got out of the shower. Let me get dressed. And the officer was like, hmm, his hair wasn't wet. That's kind of weird. And they end up barging in the door. When police entered that home, they found eight-year-old Tally Shapiro just completely beaten, bloody, laying on the floor with a steel bar on her neck. Rodney Alcala had raped her and had tried to beat her to death. And I believe he had put the bar on her throat because it was heavy in an attempt to, to make sure she was dead. And apparently she looked so bad that at first police didn't even think that she was alive, but it turned out she was. So they started rendering aid to her. And somehow in all of this, all of this getting lost in the shuffle because they were tending obviously to a dying eight-year-old, Rodney Alcala escaped. He got out of the apartment and he fled to the East Coast to evade capture. So Rodney's gone, but police have access to his apartment and they start to search it. And the things that they find are definitely disturbing. So they find a ton of photography equipment. And in itself, that wouldn't be odd because I mean, he was in school for photography. He wanted to be a professional photographer, but when you take into consideration the things he was photographing, it gets a lot more sinister. He had f numerous, numerous, numerous photos of underage girls in compromising positions, nude in their bathing suits, voyeuristic photos, just lots of really mm, gross, messed up stuff because he was a really fucking gross messed up dude through this search of his home this is when the name rodney alcala was first put on police's radar because when they were searching his home they were able to find a an id i believe it was a ucla id card but it had his name and his photo and he was then put on the fbi's most wanted list because of the horrible crime he committed and the fact that he was literally on the loose just it makes me so frustrated that he got away. This whole this whole case is really frustrating. And when I tell you that you're gonna be so mad, you're gonna be so fucking mad. If you don't already know, oh, you're gonna be so mad. I'm so mad. Can you tell him, man? I'm very mad. Okay. Rodney Alcala was apparently just like super good at hiding who he really was and manipulating people into thinking that he was a cool, great, like totally stand up dude. Because when they interviewed people who knew him, now that they had his name, they talked to, you know, friends, family, uh, teachers, and fellow students at UCLA because they had that ID. 
Everyone had nothing but good things to say about him. He was a great guy, he wouldn't hurt a fly, he was so kind and charming and wonderful, blah, blah, blah. When in reality, he was a disgusting, despicable asshole. So meanwhile, the police are looking for him and he's over there on the East Coast and he actually enrolls in the, a university in New York and he actually takes film classes under Roman Polanski. Yes, Sharon Tate's husband. Roman Polanski. What are the odds of that? I don't know. It's just super weird. But anyway, he enrolled in this school under the fake name of John Berger. And this was a name that he used from time to time. He's done with us. Speaking of this alias that he used and the, the you know, just moving on with our story, uh, Rodney Alcala ended up getting a job at a summer camp for children okay, as a photography instructor, and not for just children. This was a summer camp that was for young girls, specifically. The same man who had raped and attempted to murder an eight-year-old girl was now teaching young girls at a summer camp under the name John Berger, but it was spelled different. He would spell it different sometimes, but he always liked to use that name. It was while working at the summer camp that Rodney Alcala's luck and life on the run would come to an end. In 1971, so about three years after Rodney Alcala had brutally raped and tried to murder Tally Shapiro, there were these two girls, two campers, who had been at the, the summer camp that Rodney worked at, and Rodney had even been their instructor. Well, they went to a post office because they wanted to like mail home some letters, and while they were there, they were kind of perusing around, just looking, you know, taking in all the sights inside of the UPS store naturally. And on the wall, there was an FBI Most Wanted poster. And on this poster was Rodney Alcala's stupid fucking face. Okay. And the girls were like, wait, wait, just one damn minute. Is that Mr. Is that Mr. Burger? That can't be Mr. Burger. I think that Mr. Burger had also a description of what he did. And they were like, no. So they go back to the summer camp and they tell whoever's in charge that they're pretty sure that they had seen Mr. Burger on this FBI Most Wanted poster. And the, the person was like, no. Mr. Berger, he's wonderful, there's no way. But fortunately, this instructor did not blow these girls off and went down to the post office to look at it themselves. And they were like, oh fuck. So they call the police. The police come and arrest John Berger, Rodney Alcala, at the girls' camp in front of all these girls and all these teachers, all these people that he had worked with all this time. And he went quietly and the FBI was called and bing, bang, boom, he was in FBI custody. Which seems like that should be the end of our story, right? But look at how many minutes are left in this video, right? Right? Okay. So initially Rodney Alcala was charged with rape and attempted murder, but here's the problem. <sighs> By the time this hearing was set to begin, Tally and her family had left the States and had moved to Mexico. And when police requested that she come back and testify against her attacker, her parents were like, absolutely not. We're not going to put our young daughter through this trauma, which is reasonable. Because of this, the prosecution didn't have their primary witness and they didn't want to chance going to jury trial because they didn't think that without her testimony that the case would be strong enough, which I definitely disagree with. But because of this, he ended up getting to take a plea deal and charging to the lesser offense of child molestation for raping and attempting to murder an eight-year-old. He was given an indefinite sentence, which essentially meant he could serve anywhere from one year to life. And it was just kind of up to a parole board to decide if they thought that he was cured, rehabilitated, whatever. So he could get out in as soon as one year. He was paroled in less than three years because he, and I quote, demonstrated evidence of rehabilitation. Okay. He was a model prisoner and was even recommended for parole by the prison psychiatrist. Apparently he was cured. Everything was chill and they let this motherfucker out. All he had to do was register as a sex offender after serving only three years. Less than two months later, Rodney Alcala, you know, the guy who was, um, not a danger, was totally rehabilitated. He was a super cool dude. Everything was chill. Well, he was rearrested because he thought that his freedom was worth being risked over his disgusting compulsions when he saw a 13 year old girl walking down the street. This 13 year old girl's name was Julie and she had been just walking to school when Rodney Alcala pulled up next to her and offered her a ride. And unfortunately she accepted. 
And when they were driving, he didn't drive her to school. He drove right past her school and ended up driving her all the way to the beach where he forced her out of the car and made her sit on a rock. Once they were on the rock, they started to smoke weed. Rodney forced her to smoke weed. And he then, once she was super high and just out of her head, leaned in to kiss her, this 13 year old girl. And luckily for her, nothing else ended up happening to her because they ended up being spotted by a police officer who was in the area and the cop looked over and saw them and was like, that's suspicious. So he goes over to be like, yo, what's going on over here? Rodney tried to play it cool, but immediately the girl was like, I've been kidnapped, please uh, help me. And the officer was like, what the fuck? So he actually took them both into custody so he could figure out what exactly he had stumbled upon which was a dangerous sex offender and a young intoxicated girl. So everything Rodney was doing that day was a big no, no. So he was rearrested and was again paroled after only two years. This guy just kept slipping through the cracks. It's so irritating. Once he was released, Rodney Alcala actually got hired by the Los Angeles Times, the newspaper. Um, apparently, you know, the fact that he had a criminal record and was a registered sex offender for violence against children was of no concern. Okay, that's not fair. They just didn't run a background check, which is, okay, sure. Why not? Why not? It was during this time that Rodney got very into photography and used this to manipulate people of all ages and gender. He would tell these people that he was a professional photographer for models and fashion magazines and asked if he could take their photos for his portfolio. And please remember these photos because these photos are going to come into play later and they're a very big deal in this case. And at this time, Los Angeles was the perfect breeding ground place for him, dude, because this is a time where like, everyone was flocking to LA to be a model or an actress. And the way you got discovered was often by some famous photographer walking around and just spotting you in public. You hear so many stories back then about this. So when he would go up to them and like ask to be able to take their picture and stuff, they were like, wow, this is exactly like my foot in the door to my, my fame and my fortune and my life that I want in California. In 1978, randomly, Rodney Alcala got accepted as a contestant on the TV game show, The Dating Game. Even though at this time he had already um, raped and tried to kill an eight-year-old and was a registered child molester. The show never did a background check, so. When they brought Rodney Alcala out on the stage, he was described as, I quote here, a successful photographer who got his start when his father found him in a dark room at the age of 13, fully developed. Between takes, you might find him skydiving and motorcycling. All of this is total bullshit. Rodney Alcala actually ended up winning the date on this show and the girl who he wanted to date with, her name was Cheryl. Once she met Rodney officially off, off set, like, you know, off the show, behind the scenes in the back, she decided that she was not gonna go on this date with Rodney Alcala. She told the producers like, tell him whatever you have to. I am not going out with him because he's creepy as fuck. And yes, Cheryl, he is creepy as fuck. What Rodney goes on to do next is seen by at least one criminal profiler as a sort of response to the rejection that he felt when he was on the, the dating game show or that it exasperated a darkness that was already in this piece of shit guy, which is what I think it was, because he'd already done something, so it's not like he didn't have this in him, but they think that this sort of exasperated that. In 1979, Rodney Alcala was driving around when he noticed a, a girl, a 15-year-old girl named Monique Hoyt, and she was hitchhiking. He picked her up and the two started chatting. He told her like she was so pretty, could he please take her photo? And she had nowhere to be, so she's like, yeah, why not? And so the two drive off and they end up driving for two hours till they reach some woods. Apparently this was like the perfect place to, to take her picture. And she, what was she gonna do? She was already in the car. Once up in the woods, Rodney Alcala starts taking nude photos of this 15 year old. And it's while taking those photos that he, knocks her unconscious. Once she wakes up terrified, he sees her and he chokes her back into unconsciousness. Once she wakes up again, she decides that she's going to try to manipulate him, to try to make him think that she was okay with what happened, that she was his friend and just be really nice to him. And it actually ends up working. She's like, okay, can we like go back to your house so I can get cleaned up? I'm kind of dirty right now. And he agrees and the two start driving back and she's freaking out, I'm sure. And this idiot, this guy's so fucking dumb. He pulls over 
to use a bathroom. And once he goes into this bathroom, she fucking books it out of there. She books it out of his car, runs into a nearby, I believe it was a hotel, and is like, call the police. I have been kidnapped and I have been raped. Now, I could not find online why at this exact moment he was not arrested, like immediately, because from where I'm standing, if he had been arrested right then and there for this assault, it would have solved a lot of problems and some people would still be alive. That's all I'm saying. But I couldn't find online why he wasn't arrested right away. If you know, please let me know because I'm very confused by that. Rodney was insatiable at this point and it was in June of 1979 when he committed his next known crime in Huntington Beach, California, when 12 year old Robin Samso disappeared. Robin, who wanted to be a ballerina so badly that she got a job at a ballet studio where in lieu of payment, she would get free lessons, went missing on what would have been her first day of work. She was never seen alive again. Her body was found 12 days later by a park ranger in the hills of Los Angeles. The people closest to Robin were interviewed, obviously, and of these people who were interviewed was one of Robin's friends, a girl named Bridget, who had actually been with Robin the day that she disappeared, and she gave police a very interesting story. She said that afternoon, the afternoon that Robin went missing, her and Robin had been at the beach when a man had approached them, a man with long curly dark hair, with a camera, and he had asked if he could take pictures of them, and they were like, you know, why not? So he's taking pictures of them. When a neighbor of the girls, somebody who was also at the beach randomly, saw the interaction, came over, and shut that shit down real quick. Police asked Bridget if she could describe the man who had been taking photos of them. And she did. And from this description, they came out with a composite sketch and look at this sketch. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good likeness of Rodney Alcala in my opinion, especially for like such a young girl. I would not have been able to do so well. I know I would not have. So with this information, the description, the area it happened in, the fact that Homeboy wanted some photos of young girls, just like the ones that had been found in his apartment. And the fact that, you know, he had a record for um, raping and trying to kill young girls. Police were like, Rodney frickin' Alcala. That's who we need to talk to. So police show up to question Rodney Alcala. And when they get there, he doesn't look anything like the sketch the girl had drawn. Well, she didn't draw it, but the sketch that was drawn by the girl's description. Rodney Alcala had cut off his long, dark hair, the hair he always had and he had had it professionally straightened or chemically straightened, chemically straightened. I think he actually did it at home. But police were like, listen, you can't pull the wool over our eyes. Where were you on this day at this time, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, I wasn't there. I haven't been in that area in years. Okay, sure. In addition, and additionally, he actually had a girlfriend at this time. I know, I can't believe it. Ew, so gross, that poor girl to, to know later what he had done. Ugh. Anyway, he had a girlfriend at the time and she told police, that recently Rodney had replaced all the carpeting in his car. Anyways, police don't really believe his alibi. And though it's like pretty circumstantial, they still arrest him and bring him down to the station. And this is where Rodney made a big stupid mistake. Okay. So his sister called him or he called her, his sister and him were on the phone while he was in jail. And I don't know if he was just so arrogant that he just thought that he could get away with anything or if he didn't like, why did he not think these phone calls would be recorded? I do not know. But while he's on the phone with his sister on a phone call that's being recorded, he says to her, Hey, listen, like I have this storage unit in Seattle, Washington, and I need you to go down there and like empty it out before police find it. And first off, don't do that guys. Like if you have a loved one, I know you love your loved ones, obviously, but if they're being arrested for murdering a 12 year old, maybe don't help them hide evidence, right? Cause an innocent person doesn't have things to hide like that. Right. And, um, well, that's not necessarily true, but you know what I'm trying to say. And, uh, well, she did apparently actually try to give him an alibi for the day of the murder too. So maybe his sister was just kind of an asshole. I'm not really sure. Police hear this and they're like, oh shit, we need to get down there immediately. So they send officers to go to that storage unit like right away so that his sister can't get there and destroy evidence. And I believe they were able to find this storage locker because when they had been searching his house previously, they had come upon like either a receipt or a piece of paper that had information on a Seattle storage locker. And at the time it didn't seem like anything, but now it seemed like everything. When they get there and they get inside the storage unit, they find more than they bargained for yet. They did though. 
Inside, they found tons of photos, like the ones they had found in his house before, but it appeared at this point he had wised up and decided that it wasn't so smart to keep these photos in his home, hence this uh, storage locker. And these photos were definitely disturbing. There was a mix of photos of women, boys, but mostly young girls. There was an array of styles, some close-ups, some that could have seemed innocent if they weren't paired with the others. A lot were sexual in nature, topless photos, or photos of them in their bathing suits or underwear, mostly, again, of young girls. In addition to these photographs, they also found several pairs of earrings, and a couple of these pairs would turn out to be useful later when trying to convict and connect Rodney Alcala to other murders. Of these earrings were a pair that was believed to have been worn by 12-year-old Robin Samso, and her mother was even brought in to identify these earrings, and she said that they did belong to her daughter, and they had some unique markings on them from when they had been broken previously to show that they really did belong to Robin. In 1980, Rodney Alcala was actually tried for the murder of Robin Samso. He was convicted and he was given the death penalty. And I read in a, um, what am I doing? I read in a Los Angeles Times article, which I now am thinking is that's pretty ironic that it was Los Angeles Times since he had worked there. But anyway, I read in one of their articles that Robin's mother had actually brought a gun with her to, to these hearings with the intention to murder Rodney Alcala. And apparently she almost did. She said that he was super, super close to her. And the only reason that she didn't is one, because she felt like that's not what her daughter would have wanted. And two, because he did end up getting convicted and given the death penalty anyway. So it would have been pointless. I think had he been found innocent, she would have shot the shit out of him. And like, that's not right, but I also get it. And apparently at the trial, he was like looking over at her, smiling at her. And I believe he blew her a kiss. So fuck that guy. No wonder she wanted to kill you, among other reasons, you fucking dickhead. 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 He was a dick. Are you ready to be mad? Are you ready? Are you ready? Rodney Alcala's conviction ended up being overturned just a few years later by the California Supreme Court because the judge, during his trial, had allowed the jury to hear about his prior crimes, like the rape and attempted murder of an eight-year-old. And it was determined that the murder of Robin did not closely enough resemble the attack on Tally, Sh Tally Shapiro for it to have been relevant to have been used in Robin's trial. So the jury should not have had heard that information. Apparently they shouldn't have taken that into consideration because that violated his rights. For sure. No doubt. No doubt. So Rodney Alcala got another trial and in 1986, he was again convicted of the murder of Robin and given the death penalty. He appealed this conviction as well and got it overthrown again. I, I can't make this shit up. He got it overthrown again. So he was going to get a third trial. But fortunately, by the time this appeal went through and he was going to get his new trial, it was 2001 and technology had advanced quite a bit. So they're preparing to try this guy again. And it's during this time that they actually link Rodney Alcala to four more murders. So what had happened was, is that by this time, investigators had taken a DNA sample from Rodney Alcala, though he protested this. He really didn't want them to do that. But by this time, there was a law that was passed where if you were convicted of a felony, you legally had to give DNA. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's what the law is. And so they take his DNA, they run it through the system and they get a match. Actually, they get several matches because Rodney Alcala was just leaving his semen all over the place. And his DNA was found in his semen at several rape and murder scenes across California. In addition to the semen, DNA had also been taken off of a pair of earrings that were found in that storage locker. I believe it was off of the post, the part that goes inside your ear. And this DNA linked him to a, a murder, a murder. Because he's just dumb, 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 Rodney Ocala. So let's get into who these four women were. The first of these four was 18 year old Jill Barcombe, who was murdered in 1977. At the time of her murder, she had only even been living in the area for three weeks. Her body was found on a dirt path in Los Angeles. She was nude from the waist down and was lying in the fetal position. She was beaten, sexually assaulted and strangled with a pair of pants. She also had bite marks on her body. Initially, police believed that Jill was actually killed by the Hillside Stranglers or one of the two Hillside Stranglers, because at the time, the Hillside Stranglers and the Son of Sam were active in this area. This was just a fucking 
crazy time. Like serial killers were rapid, running rapid, running rabid. Anyways, all over the place, but DNA concluded that it wasn't the Hillside Stranglers. It was Rodney Alcala. His next known victim was killed that same year in December of 1977. This was a 27 year old registered nurse named Georgia Wixted. Georgia was found in her Malibu apartment on the floor. She was naked. She had been sexually assaulted and was tortured by being beaten with a hammer that police found near her body. In 1978, the body of 32 year old Charlotte Lamb, a legal secretary from Santa Monica was found in the laundry room of her apartment complex by her landlord, which is just so scary. That's like a public place, you know? Uh, Anyways, she was lying face up with her hands tied behind her back. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled with a shoelace, and Charlotte was actually the victim who was linked to Rodney by that pair of earrings found in his storage locker. And last, in June of 1979, 21-year-old Jill Parento was found murdered in her apartment. She was found nude with her body propped up by pillows. Her killer had broken into her apartment through a window. Police immediately suspected Rodney and believed that he had done it, but they didn't have enough evidence to actually charge him. So her case was cold for a long time before he was finally linked. So police decide that when they go to trial for the murder of Robin Samso, they actually want to include all four of these murders as well, you know, like put them all together in one trial. And of course the defense counsel tried to argue this. They tried to fight the consolidation, but the judge ended up ruling that they could be consolidated. And these two counties, because there was murders in Los Angeles and Orange County worked together to put this guy in jail, which is awesome. Teamwork makes the dream work. Anyways, I think that's really cool because we know, or you may know, if you, you know, consume a lot of true crime, that a lot of times police departments don't want to work together because it's all like a giant dick measuring contest, which I think should be um, mandatory. I think if like, whoa, I think if there are murders in several counties that are all linked to the same person, person, they should legally be, be required to work together because like, it's not about you. It's about getting a murder off the street, but that's just me. Uh, so Rodney's third and final trial was set to begin in 2010 and Rodney Alcala made the just chef's kiss decision to ditch his defense attorney and represent himself, which is so stupid. Historically, this is fucking dumb. Okay. Historically, when murderers, serial killers represent themselves, it's fucking dumb. (laughs) Like it it never goes well. I don't know why they do this, but whatever. Maybe they know they're like, I'm going down. So I want to just go down on my own, on my own power. I don't know. It's fucking dumb though. So that's what he does. And he's able to, you know, question all the witnesses. He's even able to question Robin's mother and put her through that trauma. And actually, okay. So he's questioning her and he's asking her about the earrings found in his storage locker. And if Robin had been wearing earrings that day and she looked at him and she said, you know, whether she had earrings on that day, don't you? Oh my goodness. Okay. And another thing that's super weird is that because he was his own defense attorney, he was able to question himself. So he would put himself on the stand and he would talk to himself in the third person and ask a question in one voice, respond in another voice. He was super weird. He'd be like, so Mr. Rodney Alcala, would you say that you are a dangerous man? Did you murder this woman on this day? And he'd be like, what? Me? Murder? No, never. I I would never. It's just so weird. So another super weird thing that Rodney Alcala did is he actually brought in a video of him on that game show, The Dating Game. Okay. And that hence why he's known as the dating game killer. Okay. So he brings in this video and I don't know what this was about. I don't know if he was hoping this would show like be a character witness to him or show that he was like a totally good, totally normal guy. I don't know. But he also said that like in this video and when he was on the show, he was wearing the earrings that they thought were Robin's. And this would prove that he didn't kill Robin because they were his earrings, but you couldn't even really see the earrings in the video. So it was all really pointless. So good try, bro. I don't know. Despite Rodney Alcala's just impeccable legal counsel for himself, he was convicted of all five murders. At Rodney Alcala's sentencing trial, um, (sighs) Tally Shapiro, the eight year old who he had assaulted all those years ago, she was all grown up now. She must've been like in her fifties at this point. Well, she testified against him at his sentencing trial. Now that I think about it, I think she actually testified against him at his second trial as well when she was 
in her 20s, 30s. I think she had testified against him then as well. Yeah, pretty sure. So at his sentencing hearing, Rodney Alcala played a song, which, what the, why is that even allowed? I couldn't tell you. But the song that he chose was by Arlo Guthrie, and it was called Alice's Restaurant, which is like one of the longest songs ever. I think it's like 18 minutes long. But anyway, he purposely played a very specific part of the song for the jury. A part of the song where a man being drafted in the military tells a psychiatrist the following. Shrink, I want to kill. I mean, I want to, I want to kill, kill. I want to, I want to see. I want to see blood and gore and veins in my teeth. I mean, kill, 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 kill. So when that part of the of the song was played, um, Robert Samso, which is Robin Samso's brother, the 12 year old girl who was murdered, he got up and he left. He's like, fuck this, this is ridiculous, I'm out of here, and he left. Before the jury went to make their decision on whether or not Rodney Alcala would receive the death sentence, he said to them, and I quote, this is probably the most important decision you will ever make. Choose wisely. The prosecution told the jury to deliver to Rodney Alcala a punishment no less severe than the fate he gave to his victims. Boom, bam, baby. In 2010, Rodney Alcala was sentenced to death again. So here's the issue among many issues in this case. Um, and it's that the victims that Rodney Alcala has been linked to are just that, the ones he's been linked to. Most people who know of this case and most investigators who worked on this case believe that he definitely has more victims. I mean, just by the sheer number of photos alone, the photos he had in his home and the photos he had in his storage locker, there were over a thousand, I believe. And how many of those people could be potential victims? In an effort to try to identify these people, mostly young women, whether to find out whether they're alive, dead, missing, anything, just to know who they are. The police actually did release some of these photos. I think they released like a hundred and 20, something like that. Ones that are less graphic in nature, obviously in an effort to try to identify some of these people. And some have been identified. Some have been alive. Some have reported being assaulted and some are dead. Rodney Alcala from these photographs has been linked to another three murders. These victims were 19 year old Pamela Lamsom, who went missing in San Francisco in 1977 after telling her friends that she was gonna go see a photographer. The man that she was set out to meet matched Rodney's description. The other two girls were 13-year-old Antoinette Whitaker and 17-year-old Joyce Gods, who were both murdered in Seattle near the area where Rodney Alcala had his storage unit. Police in New York, um, where we know Rodney had spent a good amount of time at a certain time in his life, were also very interested in Rodney and they looked into some of their cases and they ended up indicting Rodney Alcala on two more murders. These were the murders of Cornelia Crilly and Ellen Hofer. Ellen Hover even had the name Jane Berger on her calendar around the time she was murdered. And Rodney was even questioned about Ellen's murder years ago when it had first happened. And they had asked him like, where were you? Blah, blah, blah. And he admitted to knowing her, to going out to lunch with her, to taking photos with her. But he says he dropped her off at her apartment and then never saw her again because he soon thereafter went back to Los Angeles. And they asked him like, all right, so you, would you be willing to take a polygraph test for me? And he's like, <laughs> nah, dog, absolutely not. Rodney actually pled guilty to these two murders and he was given 25 years to life, but he's already um, on death row. So it's kind of a formality at this point. So basically he was sentenced to death plus 25 years to life. And he thought I was done. And he was linked to another murder of a woman in Wyoming. Christine Thornton went missing in 1982 while she was pregnant and was never heard from again. She was actually identified in 2015 after her sister found her photo in a heap of Rodney Alcala photos. So she, along with another family member, submitted DNA testing for Jane Doe's and discovered that Christine had actually been dead all this time. And her photo had been with Rodney Alcala, but sadly he was never able to be tried for this murder because Rodney Alcala just died like this year. Like, I think a week ago when I'm uploading this. Rodney Alcala died July 24th, 2021 of natural causes and took all of his secrets to the grave. And that, my friends, is the story of Rodney Alcala, the dating game killer. What do you think? I, for one, am perplexed by just 
so many aspects of this case. For one, did this guy have a golden horseshoe up his ass or what? How did he get away with so much shit for so long? He had a record from such a young age, but somehow was able to just like be out in the world and flourish and go on dating game shows and work for the Los Angeles time. He was doing so well and living just like the best life. Um, and he didn't deserve shit at all. Like fuck that guy. And it's annoying because it just feels like everything could have been avoided. All of it. Starting with, with poor Tally, man. Like it all could have stopped right there. He kidnapped raped and tried to murder an eight-year-old, but because a traumatized child doesn't want to testify against the man who tried to kill her, he fully intended to kill her. He beat her with a steel bar and left her for dead, but because she's strong enough and lucky enough to have pulled through that, he gets charged with only child molestation? Are you kidding me? That's ridiculous. That makes me so mad. And then I think about the dating show, the dating game show, I forget what it's called every time, but can you imagine being that woman, Cheryl, and just knowing that because you trusted your instincts, it may have saved your life? Like imagine, I, I, I kind of feel like if she had gone on that date, nothing would have happened because he would have been too connected to her, but he also just seems to be, like he doesn't give a fuck. So it's just crazy, like how it must have felt to know that you could have, went on a date with this guy after going on a show. And I assume when you go on there, you was, you imagine that these guys are checked out or that they at least look into the fact that they're okay guys. And man, I just, that bull, I think about that and I'm like, what? and I have no doubt in my mind that he's committed more murders. I think the fact that Christine Thornton was linked to him just by her photo is evidence of that, like just in general. And that's kind of why I feel like getting this video out right now is important because he he's dead now, which first off, bye. But second, like there's now not even, there's no chance of getting any more information from him. That is gone. Not that he was much of a talker anyway, but he's gone. So the only way to identify these people is by people seeing the photos, hearing the story and people looking into it and seeing if they recognize anybody. And if these people are missing or dead, it's like, like fuck, you know, but, but anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope you found this, this, my delivery interesting and informative and that it gave you every bit of information you would want when looking into this case. And of course, thank you for sitting and discussing this case with me because I think it's definitely worth remembering. I think it's important to remember these women and these girls who lost their lives because Rodney Alcala was an asshole who put, who valued controlling and hurting women over their lives. And that, and you know, that's just like so messed up. So if you get a chance to browse through these photos uh, that he had in his possession and see if you recognize anybody or send them to, if you know somebody who's had a loved one or someone they know go missing or turn up dead, just maybe send it to them so they can look and see if he had their photo. Cause who knows, maybe, maybe it could help someone, some family get some closure. But anyways, guys, please let me know down below of any other cases you would like to see me cover. As you know, I have a very long list, but every time you leave a suggestion, I add it to my list with your name next to it to give you a shout out. So I want to look into the cases that you guys are interested in because I know you're filled with good taste and good ideas. Otherwise, you would not be here. If you haven't already, of course, make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out a new Morbid Makeup video every single week. Sometimes I put out two videos a week and I'd love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. They're both Bratterstein. I also have a Facebook page and a Facebook group. Everything will be linked down below for your convenience. And if you're ever curious about the makeup, the nail polish, the earrings, any of that, I always list that down below for you as well, in case you're curious so that you can find the stuff. And with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. At the very least, be better than Rodney Alcala, and I hope to see you in my next video.